And uh, it's a pleasure talking to you from the southern tip of Cape Town in South Africa. And thank you very much to the Teddy Clef team to, for the invitation to speak on what kind of treatment from Clef and palliative care. I'm going to be talking. Oh, my screen not. Uh, there you go. I'm going to be talking to you um, using data that I've collected at the University of the Western Cape and also at the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital Cleft Lip and Palate Unit over the last number of years. The talk will start with um, a few mentions on the burden of care. I'll talk about alveolar bone grafting, definitive orthodontics, monitoring of facial growth, orthognathic treatment, and if we've got time, the role of the in research. So if we go back to 2005, it was Gunvar Sen who first published this paper on the burden of care, where she looked at a number of European centers and found to her horror that the number of operations per, cent uh, per center ranged from 3.5 to 6. The length of orthodontic treatment from 3.3 to 8.5 years. And the attendance figures for the patients were from 49 to 94 visits. And for those who had early orthopedics, they had up to 15 months of treatment, up to 17 visits. And in many instances, they were actually hospitalized for 146 days. Now these are aspects of treatment that have to be considered in addition to everything else that the patient is subject to and the family. We've got to think about the time that the parents have to take from work to get the child back and forth to clinics, the amount of time the child might lose from school attending all the different um, uh, specialists, who's going to cover the cost of transport, who's going to cover the cost of treatment. We've also got to think about the family dynamics and the effects that all these um, appointments are going to have on the family dynamics. How much time is being spent concentrating on providing care for the one child when there are other children in the family? So sibling relationships can also be affected. And because of the amount of time that's, uh, that's uh, spent at these different clinics, what is the educational achievement of the patient going to be? And is all of this going to affect the quality of their life? Other aspects of burden of care have also been highlighted by Oberoi et al. in 2008, where they found that factors contributing to severe maxillary hyperplasia included early pharyngeal flap surgery, repeat palatal surgeries, and iatrogenic factors associated with inconsistent team care or lack of care. So to go back to my early days, um, where it was not unusual for us to be taking impressions for uh, newborn patients and providing different sorts of appliances, either to uh, move the different segments or to help with feeding and manipulating the sort of premaxilla. So, but it was about 25 years ago that I, sorry, that I actually stopped using all of these appliances following the publication of a number of randomized control trials. The first one being by Sean Bannister, where they looked at patients and measured their weight gain and their growth and compared those with feeding plates to those without feeding plates. And they concluded that there was absolutely no difference in weight gain and growth those um, findings were confirmed by Prahl in Holland and Mazare in uh, America. There were a couple of randomized control trials in Holland that looked at the approximation of the arch segments in patients with and without pre-surgical orthopedics or feeding plates. They also looked at the um, appearance of the lip and the appearance of the nose. And they found that there was no difference between those who had these appliances and those who didn't. But one of the negative findings they did find in, in Holland was that the oral flora of the patients uh, became karyogenic within only a couple of weeks of um, using these appliances. 
And an interesting finding that wasn't and hasn't seemed to be followed up by many people was um, presented by Alison Williams on the speech of patients. And she showed that at nine years of age, the speech of those who had had pre-surgical orthopedics and feeding plates was actually less intelligible than those who hadn't had it. So as far as the feeding plates go, we've got to consider what actually happens with swallowing. Now, if you go during swallowing, we need a seal at the front of the mouth and a seal in the palate. The patient with a cleft, we're not going to get a seal at the front. And the patient with a cleft palate, we're certainly not going to get a seal at the back. So the appliances that most people use will only extend as far as the hard and soft tissue uh, junction. So at no point will we be able to create a vacuum for the patient or the bolus of food to descend down to the, um, through the esophagus. So fitting all of these appliances may have some effect, but I'm not going to talk about NAM because I am still waiting for the randomized control trials to uh, publish the results of the NAM appliance and similar appliances. One other thing though, in um, early stages of management of these patients is strapping. And this is just an example where a dynacleft has been used. It's pretty simple, it's not particularly invasive. And within a couple of weeks, you can get a um, huge improvement in the position of the premaxilla. However, there are still some researchers who are concerned that restriction of the premaxilla may influence growth of the mid face, and this is yet to be established. So with all this in mind, we've also got to consider what's going on with the rest of the dentition. And as orthodontists, we need to communicate with the general dentist to make sure that we don't end up with uh, having to manage uh, dentitions like this. And people need to understand that the deciduous dentition does act as a scaffold uh, for the developing permanent dentition and that early loss can complicate problems and make our, difficult, our, our job even more difficult. And the difficulties that we find with uh, CLEP patients, and especially with the uh, dental anomalies, are that they present often with misshaped or hyperplastic teeth. They have supernumerary teeth, teeth are ectopic, and in many instances, there are missing teeth. And all of this adds to the difficulty of treatment planning and providing a high standard of care. In a recent paper that was published in the EJO, we looked at, a at the uh, scan cleft um, patients. There are over 400 uni unilateral cleft lip and palate patients. And when we looked at the dental anomalies, we found that missing or agenesis of teeth was present in 52.6% of the cases. There were supernumerary teeth in 16.9% of the cases. The cleft lateral was missing in 43.7% and the lateral was peg-shaped in 45% of the cases. There was ectopic eruption of 14.6% 14, of them and transposition of 4.3%. In addition, there was intra-occlusion of one or several primary molars. And as I said, all of these anomalies add to the difficulty of treatment planning and the difficulty in achieving a good result. This poor patient has so many anomalies. He has a missing upper left central and lateral incisor. The canine has erupted close to the contact point with the molar, and this premolar has an ex extra cusp. So you can imagine planning orthodontic treatment for that patient is particularly difficult. So that brings us on to the orthodontics. Because of the burden of care and the concern about the burden of care, we try our best to restrict the orthodontic treatment to only three periods. That first period is going to be for those who require pre-alveolar bone graft treatment. Definitive orthodontic treatment is started usually between 11 and 13 years of age when most of the permanent teeth have erupted. And a third stage might be relevant for those who require orthognathic surgery. 
So for alveolar bone grafts, this procedure aims to restore bone volumes in the tooth-bearing portion of the maxilla. It also aims to unify the different segments of the cleft maxilla. It provides the opportunity for closure of residual oronasal fistula and provides bone for spontaneous eruption of the teeth, usually the canine, but sometimes the lateral incising. It also provides an improvement in the ala base aesthetics and provides greatly improved orthodontic outcomes, which obviates the need for prosthetics where appropriate. So in orthodontics, the aim is to correct anterior and buccal cross bites, to align or partially align the incisors, and to open the cleft space to create access for the surgeon. And you'll see here an illustration with a removable quad helix, which we prefer because it can be removed at every visit to adjust, and it's held in place with separating elastics. So here are some examples of patients before and after bone grafts. This patient has bi uh, bi bilateral cleft lip and palate. The anterior cross bite was corrected prior to the bone graft. And two years later, we have a unified maxilla and he's ready for the canines to erupt into that space. You can see the prominence of those teeth there. A very similar case where the premaxilla was proclined. We didn't achieve quite as much expansion in the buccal segments as we had hoped, but even so, that can easily be corrected now with orthodontic treatment. So some of the clinical details for um, alveolar bone grafts. We re removed the quad helix prior to the bone graft, so the, patient, the surgeon's got access to the palatal mucosa. If the teeth have got brackets on them, they are secured with a 1925 stainless steel arch wire, but otherwise the expansion is maintained with a posterior palatal arch. We always take radiographs before the surgery and oblique occlusal radiograph is taken again six months post-surgery so that we can assess the success of the bone graft and measure the bone graft success rate. This is an example of a patient where the cleft has now been completely obliterated. The bone level is almost at the cement flue enamel junction on that tooth. Uh, another patient, again, showing the lateral that's in, uh, erupting into the space, but the whole of the uh, cleft has been obliterated by the bone. The bone extends beyond the apex of the central and is at the level of the cemento enamel junction. And these radiographs are useful because they are used to measure the success rate. And the success rate in the UK is measured using the Skindlund scale. Skindlund scale shows a grade one case, sorry, grade one, where more than 75% of the cleft has been filled with bone. Grade two would be 50 to 75%. Grade three is less than 50% and grade four where there's no complete bony ridge. Grades three and grades four are considered failures. So we use the Kendallin scale to look at the success rates of the patients at uh, Manchester Children's Hospital to audit the, um, to audit the bone grafts. We had 160 consecutive patients, 97 of them were UCLP, 38 were bilateral cleft lip and palate, and 25 were cleft lip and alveolus only. We had records for 100% of the patients, and there were 199 cleft sites. The average age of the patients at bone graft was about 9.1. A couple of patients came at a later age, and we, um, those were immigrant patients from out of the UK. The number of patients who had orthodontic treatment was uh, prior to the bone graft was 56%, and they had approximately 10 appointments, at least 10 months of treatment over with 9.7 appointments. A 
and we only had 10 patients out of those 160 with repeat breakages. So the results showed the intra and inter Kappa statistics were acceptable. There was 95% agreement and 99.5% of the graphs were successful. There were only two failures and these were repeated at a later stage. Overall, we had 92% of the patients in grade one, 7% in grade two, and 0.5 for each grade three and grade four. And as I said, those, were the only, those two were repeated at a later stage. So the conclusions were that the alveolar bone grafts by a single surgeon between 2011 and 2016 were at 99.5% success rate which was above the gold standard, which in the UK is now set at 95%. And to remind you that prior to reorganization, the success rate for alveolar bone grafts in the UK was only 56, 58%. And this is an example of how high volume operators can achieve much higher um, standards. I'm just mentioning the Bogan scale because this is a scale for assessing bone graft success that's used in mostly uh, Northern Europe. So that brings us on to the definitive orthodontics. As I've mentioned, the orthodontics is difficult. They, there are a number of dental anomalies that make it more difficult. And of course, there's also the growth of the mid face that has an effect. And sometimes, and thankfully, not very often do we get cases like this where there's been severe restriction in the um, maxillary arch. Patients presented late, the molars, of, first molars have been taken out, lateral incisors are missing. But in the end, we were able to achieve a, a reasonable result. But this, as I said, is a very severe case and the type that we don't often see anymore. Another patient with um, some unusual teeth in the upper arch and at the end of treatment with some composite restorations ready to go off to the uh, prosthodontist for better management. Again, rather difficult to get a reasonable result. And finally, this one was particularly difficult and impossible to get a decent result. So you can see the um, missing lateral, we ended up having to take out that lateral, had too much space and that canine couldn't be um, extruded adequately. But I think with some prosthodontic restoration, that could be a reasonable result. But fortunately, the majority of patients actually present with these sort of cases. And it's important to say now that extraction where there is crowding is preferable in patients with clefts. Treating them on extraction and proclining the lower incisors can end up with a greater burden of care because with growth that patient is going to become more class three and you're going to end up with a reverse overjet. However, you'll notice that with this case, we did leave the um, diminutive lateral, which resulted in a slight um, effect on the center line. But rather that than have a porcelain crown or composites that are going to be, have to be restored every now and again. And this young patient, he had missing upper laterals. We closed the space and that seems to be the uh, preferable course of treatment these days. Um, we maintain the symmetry and you will see he's had first premolars extracted in the lower arch. He now needs to have the canines reshaped and made to look more like lateral incisors. A, a reasonable result. And this patient with a bilateral, bilateral cleft lip and palate, she presents with a um, hyperplastic upper left lateral and all that's required now is for that to have some prosthodontic treatment and a very good result for her. This young boy we decided that because the facial features and the proportions were all acceptable 
and they weren't over concerned about the midline being off to the left, we completed his treatment without opening up the space and accepting the compromise of the midline. And it's quite uh, unusual how in many instances, people do not notice that sh midline shift. I've shown this case to a number of maxillofacial and plastic surgery trainees, and the only thing they could find wrong with this patient was the heavy restoration of amalgam in that tooth. None of them noticed the missing lateral incisor or the shift of the midline. So an acceptable result. And even in severe cases like this, it's possible with simple orthodontics, light forces to eventually end up with a good occlusion and this patient's being prepared for a prosthetic replace replacement of those lateral incisors. So I just want to mention the PAR score because that's this is what we use for measuring the success in um, orthodontic treatment. We've already met, uh, mentioned the, part the uh, Kinderman index. Now the PAR index is one that was uh, developed to provide a single summary score for all the occlusal anomalies which may be found in a malocclusion. The score provides an estimate for how far excuse me, a case deviates from normal alignment and occlusion. And the difference in scores between pre and post treatment cases reflects the degree of improvement and therefore the success of treatment. A diferença de pontuação em nos casos. Sorry, hello. Um, so at uh, Manchester, we looked at 100 to consecutive patients with UCLP and BCLP and use the PAR index to assess the, the overall um, outcome. We found that those with unilateral cleft lip and um, palate had an 84.3% improvement in their PAR. Their treatment took only 23.7 months with 20.1 appointments. With the BCLP patients, there was an 80.9% improvement in the PAR, 27.8 months in treatment and 20.5 appointments. The longer treatment is possibly due to the BCLP patients having more dental anomalies. Extractions were performed in 25% of the UCLP patients and 35.5% of the BCLP patients. And where a lateral was uh, missing, the choice was to try and close the space rather than open it up. In UCLP patients, the space was closed in 91.5% of the cases, and in BCLP patients, the space was closed in 87% of the cases. Another aspect of the PAR index is the PAR normogram. So this shows you the distribution of the success rate of the patients. So they can be categorized into those who are greatly improved, those who are improved and those who are worse off or no better off. And with our UCLP patients, you can see the vast majority were in the greatly improved uh, category. In the BCLP patient uh, category, only two patients were in the, the improved and the rest were all in the greatly improved category. Oops. Um, oh, sorry, I'll just go back. So if we look at this in comparison to standard audit figures in, in the UK, we find that it is possible to improve on the national uh, audit for cleft patients. We achieved an 82% improvement compared to the standard, which was 69%, and was even better than the non-clef standard. We also had zero patients who had less than 70% improvement. So the conclusions from that study were that the mean percentage of power reduction compares very well with other reports looking at um, outcomes. The recommended final power score for a cleft unit is 69%, for a non-cleft unit is 75%, and we managed to achieve 82.6%. And I think a lot of this is due to history. Some of those standards have been set uh, some years ago, 
um, and um, I think it's time for, for them to revisit. So that now brings us on to the monitoring of facial growth. Gunvarsen once again was able to show that with BCLP patients, you start with the more prominent premaxilla, and by the age of at the age of five, you start off with an SNA of eighty-five, but by twenty, it is down to seventy-five or seventy-four. So these patients become progressively more class three. So we've got to consider this, and also with the unilateral cleft patients, they also become progressively more class three. But at what stage do you provide treatment? I mean, some people might, with six or seven year olds with prominent um, incisors, provide them with a functional appliance. Now that would be completely inappropriate, knowing that with a cleft patient, that they will become more class three anyway. So growth is a very, yeah, understanding growth of these patients is very important. But it's not only growth that affects the position of the, uh, it's not only growth that affects the class three nature. We've also found quite recently that, again, looking at the scant cleft patients, we found that some patients who were missing two or more teeth in the maxilla were more likely to have a Goslon score of four or five. In other words, severe class threes. So you've heard that missing teeth can contribute to a class uh, development of a class three occlusion. Well, in this group, we found it had to be two or more teeth, not just one. So the conclusion there was maxillary dental agenesis does impact on craniofacial growth. And it's something that we need to consider in our orthodontic treatment planning. So this shows us in picture form of what's happening with a number of patients in growth. If we look at a patient at 4, 8, 12, and 16, you can see how this patient has a deteriorating class three pattern. It's no good looking at this young four-year-old and saying what a good result has been achieved. And at 12, we've got to decide how much and what sort of orthodontics to, um, to provide for the patient. Another patient with deteriorating class three, here he is at 12, 16, and 18. And even between 16 and 18, you can see the maturing features with the supraorbital bossing, the much larger mandible and completely inhibited miss mid face. And this patient who at 18 decided that he was satisfied with his uh, appearance and didn't want any further treatment, but at 21 returned after university with a more pronounced class three um, malocclusion and uh, requiring orthognathic surgery. So that brings us on to orthognathics. What is the incidence of the class three uh, patients? Well, in the non-cleft uh, population, it's only two to 4%, but in cleft patients, it's 15 and you know, minimum of 15% all the way up. Uh, when the surgery is performed, only 0.1% of the non-cleft patients require orthognathic surgery to compensate for the skeletal uh, differences. But if any number, it depends which unit you're looking at and whose results you're looking at um, in the cleft uh, population. Um, but also what is interesting is that in the cleft population, nobody requires mandibular reduction only uh, whereas in the non-cleft population, at least 10% do. So we're looking at the skeletal pattern, we're looking at the soft tissue pattern, and we relate the lips and the soft tissue to some of these planes that have been described by different uh, authors over the years. We look at the angulation of the teeth, we look, and look 
at the way the angulation of the teeth influences the soft tissues. If the incisors are too proclined, you can end up with uh, proclining the, um, the lips. If they look too upright, you can end up with dishing the profile. So a few important statements in uh, papers that have been published recently. The craniofacial morphology of this population is considerably different and significant to those without cleft. They present with maxillary retrusion and a reduced vertical proportions, which can be compromised by, by maxillary retroclination and increased chin protrusion. It can also be anticipated that these effects become more obvious as growth continues through adolescence. Another quote, a complete decompensation of the dental arches is not advocated prior to surgery, as this can reverse the overjet such an extent that surgical maxillary advancements of the maxillary or bimaxillary surgery is then required and thus places a greater burden of care on the patient. Also facial harmony is particularly challenging in patients with uh, clefts. They have additional soft tissue factors including lack of upper lip support, deficient nasal tip projection and paranasal hollowing. Unilateral clefting may also introduce asymmetries and there will be varying thickness of the lips depending on the cleft type and may necessitate further soft tissue revisions. I'm going to hurry along because I see time is um, uh, passing quickly. So during the planning, we plan to provide the patient with a balanced and well-proportioned profile. So by advancing the maxilla, the lips remain in a good relationship to these planes. If we procline the lower incisors too much, the lower lip is projected beyond the plane. The maxilla then has to be advanced even further to match that procline lower and the upper lips then become um, everted and prominent. And what uh, often happens with these patients, the further you advance the maxilla, the more effect you have on the nasal tip, you raise the nasal tip. But you also can increase the width of the nose at the alar base by as much as 24%. And that surely can't be a, an aim of orthodontic surgery. And what also happens with the bilateral, at least with the cleft patients who start off with a thin upper lip, that lip can be stretched even further so that if you procline those lower incisors, the advancement of the uh, maxilla results in a thinning of the upper lip and a soft tissue profile that is actually more class three than when you started. So the goals of cleft's orthognathic surgery are to provide the patient with an improved facial harmony and a balanced profile with balanced proportions. They should also have a functional inclusion. The surgery should have minimal effect on speech and we should be able to improve satisfaction with, with appearance and the patient should have an improved quality of life. So I'm going to show you a few patients where this patient is before and after orthognathic surgery. And after orthognathic surgery, he has his rhinoplasty. And you can see an improved balance of proportions, um, increased lower lip, increased um, lower face height. These are his teeth. This patient with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. This is before surgery, after orthognathics. Oops, take a pun. Um, before surgery, after orthognathics and uh, rhinoplasty. These are his teeth before. He was missing upper laterals and it was nicely aligned, leveled and aligned, and that's then at the end of treatment. And that's just to show the symmetry that one can, that can be achieved with uh, rhinoplasty in patients with, cleft, with bilateral cleft lip and palate. This patient with a unilateral cleft lip and palate you can see him before and after simple advancement of the maxilla. 
and that's in after the rhinoplasty. So once again, improved contour on, of the cheek, increased lip length, increased lower face height post-surgery. Those are his teeth. Excuse the gingival inflammation. If this was done on the day of D-band. And this patient also, you can see an improved um, facial profile, increased lip length, and lower face height. Those are his teeth. You'll notice he's missing an upper left, upper right lateral, and the canine has been modified to appear. So, <clears throat> Excuse me. At uh, Manchester, we looked at 26 of our consecutive um, orthognathic patients. 20 were male, 6 were female, 15 had unilateral cleft palates, 7 had bilateral cleft palates, and 4 had cleft palate only. Of these, 24 had maxillary osteotomies only, 2 who had, had enlarged mandibles had bimaxillary osteotomies, and one of them had a genioplasty. Our figures from start of treatment showed that we already had slightly reclined upper and lower um, incisors. And there was a definite class three relationship. Post surgery, our figures approached normal, excuse me, except that the upper incisors were proclined at 114 degrees, and we managed to maintain the upright um, position of the lower incisors. And the average um, maxillary advancement was 7.4 degrees. We used the power nomogram to illustrate the improvements in the occlusal features of these patients so that all of them ended up in the greatly improved category. And when we compared our results to Great Ormond Street and Bristol Hospital, we found 24 of our patients were Le 4 one only compared to Great Ormond Street, where they had more BIMAX approach than uh, the 4 one only approach. We also had a PAR result, which was um, significantly different. So our orthognathic audit standards, we achieved all of them and had greatly improved mean improvement in the PAR results. And the average treatment time was actually 18.9 months. So just a quick flick through some of the cases. Um, I see we are running out of time. That patient, the upper lateral was extracted so that we had control of the central uh, of the midline. And that's him at the end of treatment. And a couple of examples of what not to do. Proclining the lower incisors ends up with a thinner upper lip, as you can see on these slides. Um, proclining ends up with eversion of both upper and lower lip. And again, proclining of upper and lower lip. And I think, sadly, we're not going to have time for to go through this um, section on, on research. But as you will see, none of this research is possible without taking good clinical records. As orthodontists, you're the only ones who are going to take the records. Don't think that the surgeons are going to be taking impressions or photographs for you, or even organizing it. You have to do it. And it's only with these sort of records that I think these um, research projects can be uh, conducted and you can measure the outcomes of different aspects of orthodontic and cleft care in your units. And I think that's important because these um, studies with the Goslon Index have had a significant um, influence in what's happened with AmeriCleft, with the CSAG studies in the UK, showing that high volume operators achieve better results. Um, that's, um, I'd better leave it at that. But it does mean that if you're going to collect records, you've got to be seeing a large number of patients. 
if you're only seeing six types of cleft per year, it'll take you 47 years to collect enough patients to conduct a study on your outcomes. So just remember, the more you see, the sooner you can be measured and sooner you can measure others. And lastly, don't forget, we're members of a team and we need to communicate with all the different members and keep in touch with them. Thank you very much. I think we have come to 45 minutes. So I'll go back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayden. Thank you for the very comprehensive and yet concise, concise lecture. At this point, I'd like to ask all attendees to please type your questions in the question box. If you have any questions with Dr. Hayden, kindly type your questions in the, in the question box, in the question and answer box. Um, Dr. Hayden, I just wanted to ask, I noticed you didn't say anything about pre-surgical implant orthopedics in your, in your presentation. Actually, I did mention it right at the beginning. I okay. said that it's, it's something that I haven't practiced for more than 20 years, and I stopped okay. using it because of the randomized control studies that were published in the UK and in Holland, where they found that there was no okay. difference with um, the appearance of the lip, the appearance of the nose, the approximation of the different segments of the maxilla. Um, yeah. They found no difference between those factors between patients who had or didn't have pre-surgical orthopedics. And I know it's a controversial subject and there are surgeons all over the world who will not touch a patient unless they've had pre-surgical orthopedics. But for all of these patients that I've shown you the results, not a single one yeah. of them had any pre-surgical um, pre orthopedic um, treatment. So it's possible to achieve high standards and good quality outcomes with that, with that approach. It is possible. So I hope that's Thank you. Fun. Okay. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. I could just go back to um, the, uh, oh, I forgot. Sorry. Okay, carry on. <laughs> You know, you could go back. We're waiting for questions um, from attendees. So far, we don't have much questions. I mean, the lecture was quite explanatory and, and very well presented, I must Thank say. You. So you could go back while we, while we wait for some more questions from, from okay. other colleagues. Well, as far as the uh, NAM appliance goes, I know that there are many adherents of the, and um, it is very popular in many centers around the world. But as, as yet, they have not um, been involved in any randomized control trials. And I think it's important you know, to, to encourage people, if they're using a new technique or whatever, it needs to be examined. You know, how much of it is opinion, how much of it is selected cases, or, you know, a genuine randomized control trial that shows that either it's of great benefit or it's of no benefit, you know, whatever it's going to show. But that we need to have the evidence there before providing treatment for our patients. We've got a very good example of what's going on with evidence and, um, and care at the moment with COVID. I mean, you know, vaccinations. You don't just um, roll out the first vaccine that's developed. You, know, you need evidence that these things are going to work. And it's the same with medicine. It's the same with orthodontics. Any treatment that we provide our patients with has to be shown to be of benefit. That's fine. Um, um, for some of our centers here in Nigeria, uh, I can speak for Luth. We more recently started using the dam appliance. Um, we hadn't been doing much of that before, and um, it was premised on the evidence we saw in the literature about the improvements in the in the nasal form of the patients, apart from the other um, benefits of aligning the soft tissue segments and the maxillary act segment before surgery. So 
that is, I mean, that, that's the basis on which we premised our use of their plans, you know, um, in at least in my center. And um, it, it would be nice for us, just like you said, to carry out uh, when we have high volume, when we've done in quite a number of cases, to actually look at the evidence we obtain prior to research to see whether there has actually been significant benefits uh, obtained from the outcome of the of this yeah. patient, like you rightly said. And I think one of the problems with cleft research is that the patients usually got to be quite old before you look at some of these outcomes. You can be providing care, and I showed you those pictures of some of the. You know, that four that four year old child, his uh, results looked fantastic, but by the time he was sixteen or eighteen, they you know, it was it would have been considered a failure. So, you know, sure. for uh, for a lot of the treatments that's provided at such an early age, you really need a long term randomized control trial. Now. Yeah. People have been trying to encourage uh, different centers to get involved, you know, so that we can, at the end of the day, say, you know, this is a benefit. You know, use it where you can, or you can say it's not a benefit. But to set up those studies takes an enormous amount of time. And to get to the point where you can say at the age of 15, this is a fantastic result. And this patient's been through all these treatment protocols, and it's because of those treatment protocols that you've got a fantastic result. But you're not going to know that until you've got a range of patients at, 30, at 15 years of age. And so that's why, you know, for a lot of people, pre-surgical orthodontics, which is uh, orthopedics, which was shown for uh, many years ago in Holland, to have had no benefit on the lip, on the uh, nose, on the alignment of the segments. It, in Northern Europe, they stopped doing, uh, stopped using pre-surgical orthopedics um, 20 or 30, 25 years ago. And as I've shown the patients that I showed, none of them had pre-surgical orthopedics, and yet we were able to achieve um, you know, good pretty pretty good results. Yes, thank you and very much, Dr. Hayden. Yes, thank you. Sorry to stop. There's a, there's a question for you in the question box. It says, um, what is the level of orthognathic surgery in African countries, and what are the requirements to start this discipline? Um, I guess What's that's the level in? What's the level in? of autognatic surgery in African countries? I do not know. Um, mm. There are no studies have been conducted. No Goslon studies have been conducted apart from the one we did at Red Cross. We found that 30% of our patients needed um, orthognatic surgery. They fitted into the uh, category four and five Goslon, which meant they needed orthognathic surgery to correct the facial deformity. So that was about 30%, but that was a fair result. If you look, if I can just go back a little bit and show you the um, results of the AmeriCleft study, you can see that in some cases in America, in one center, they required 60% of their patients required orthognathic surgery. And if we look at the um, good practice archive from Oslo, the, only 10% of their patients needed orthognathic surgery. So mm -hmm. the um, demand for orthognathic surgery varies tremendously. And it is um, an, in, an indicator of the the skill of the surgeon, it has now been decided. It's not just inherent growth. There are other factors that cause the inhibition of growth of the mid face. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I can't give the figure for generally in Africa. All I can say is that the one center that has had a Goslon assessment is the Red Cross Children's Hospital, and that's old material. Um, mm -hmm. Almost 30% of our cases needed uh, orthognathics. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayden. As a follow-up to that, I, I wanted to, I, 
he didn't talk too much about destruction of stereogenesis. Is that something that you've routinely used? It's it's also one of the procedures we are we are really trying to introduce to our centers here. Uh, I've um, experienced destruction of stereogenesis only for patients with uh, craniofacial anomalies, not just not trying to correct class three occlusion. Um, again, that's um, a set that procedure hasn't been assessed in terms of the, the burden of care. And I know that there was a um, paper published from Manchester on non-cleft patients by Nikki Mandel on the use, to, use of distraction osteogenesis um, and how many patients where it was successful. Um, I can't remember the details, but it's Nikki Mandel and it was a randomized control trial of the use of distractions, osteogenesis in class three cases, which is a um, very good paper to look at. In terms of the um, de Klerk bollards, do you know the de Klerk bollards that have been used for distraction of uh, the maxilla? Mm -hmm. Denmark at the moment, two centers in Denmark at the moment are undergo uh, undergoing a trial to see if that's appropriate treatment for cleft patients. So at the moment, there's not very much um, evidence to go on, but it sounds like it could be a good idea, but do you, at the end of the day, has the patient had fewer operations? Has the patient had more appointments? Has the patient lost more or less time from school? All of those aspects need to be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Roger, Hello, I mean, okay. Hello Dr. Yes. Dr. Ekena. Yes. I can, I can, I can see, see Dr. Ose. Yes. He raised the hand yes. there. Dr. Ose, please. Okay, go ahead. Ask your question. I can write, could you write it on the question answer, please? Can he type it in, can he type it in the chat box? We still have some time. He, he, can he type it in the chat box? And, and, and Beckett, you could interpret it if it's not in English. Okay. Okay, you can go ahead. Is what we have. Uh, we have uh, four minutes. Yes, is Doctor Say does, does he still want to ask his question or has he? I don't know. I can get to it. Okay, so I th I think we're about to round up. We have uh, well, we still have five minutes to go. Um, maybe we could ask Doctor Hayden. I know you've been very actively involved in trying to bring. Um, trying to form an AFRICLEFT, more or less, as, as, as we call it, since all that, I mean, we know you've you reported in your presentation, I mean, in your presentation today, you talked about the Scandi cleft, Euro cleft, Ameri cleft, and unfortunately, we have very few reports from Africa, so maybe you want to throw more light on, on how we can address this, so that moving forward, Africa would also have a voice in reporting some of our findings from our, from our patients with clefts and our cleft treatment outcomes. Yes, thank you. Um, it's been uh, something that I've been trying to promote for many years, but as you can imagine, it's, it is rather difficult. Um, and it does mean that people have to be very good at collecting, collecting records, but it's not impossible. Because of the few numbers, it, it is generally um, difficult for one sensor to provide enough information. And therefore, I think it's important that we collaborate with other centers, with the, each other and with other countries. So there's enough material can be gathered to, um, to start doing things like this Red Cross uh, study that we did here. Um, we had collected, uh, I think it was 37 patients 
but since then I haven't been able to get any other centers um, involved. But you can do these intercenter studies with fewer than 36 patients. So I would encourage everybody who's interested is to be absolutely thorough at collecting study models, taking x-rays and taking photographs. And it's those records that can be used to start collaborating and getting intercenter studies and getting ready for presentations. I know the next uh, international cleft lip and palate uh, meeting is going to be held in Edinburgh next year, but I suspect it's a little bit too late to um, to do anything for that. But in four of that, four years time, I'm not sure because of the COVID delays, it might be four years time before the next meeting in Japan. And you know, if we could even have two centers comparing their results for an African presentation, it would be fantastic. Because lately, the only things that we've managed to present are some very well received um, uh, presentations where we've had a lot of support from Nigeria and Ghana. And um, you know, those have been very successful presentations at the international meetings. So people, you know, I'm going to be um, sending out an email in the next few days to as many people as I, as, whose addresses I have and request that um, it can be passed on to even more people. And hopefully we can start building on that. And I think you are an ideal person to start helping with that again. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hayden. Uh, challenge accepted, we pay for the place to see you. Thank you. So at this point, in the absence of um, no further questions, on behalf of, of, of Small Train and the Nigerian Association of Orthodontists who um, invited you for this uh, session, we want to extend our sincere gratitude to you, Dr. Hayden, for the beautiful presentation and inspiring presentation as well. To us all, we're very grateful. I want to thank all our attendees. And of course, we want to thank all those who walked behind the scenes, Beckett and the rest of the team, our translators, to make this session a very successful one. So Beckett, I, I, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ekena. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Thank you very much to everyone. And um, this, is, this was a brilliant presentation and we wish you a great week and hope to meet you next Monday.